Welcome back. We're going to be covering Chapter 3 in this playlist, and uh, this is going to be Development Through the Lifespan. So the lifespan starts with conception and takes us through infancy and childhood and adolescence, young adulthood, regular adulthood, and all the way to, uh, unfortunately, death. So it's a lar large amount of information in one chapter that we're, we're going to cover. So I'm going to be hitting sort of the big basic issues. Uh, most schools who teach introductory psychology also include a lifespan development class. So if you find this really interesting, um, you can spend an entire quarter taking lifespan development. All right, so in the beginning, conception. So what you're seeing in these images um, on the left, you can see a lot of the egg, like most of the egg is visible in that picture, and it's the big globe. It's being swarmed by a bunch of sperm that are trying to penetrate the shell of the egg, and I call it a shell. It's not a shell like a chicken egg has. It's um, more porous than that because it never has to be outside or be sat on by a chicken or something. Um, so it is a, a little um, more malleable, but it is still a surface that needs to be penetrated, right? So it's got a membrane around it. So each of these sperm is attempting to be the first one to make it through the membrane. And on the right-hand picture, you see the, the, the winner. He made it through the, um, the membrane, and now that sperm and its 23 individual chromosomes will pair up with the egg's 23 individual chromosomes to create 23 pairs of chromosomes. And then we will have the blueprint for the new um, little blastocyst is what's gonna happen next. So let's talk about prenatal development. The, the zygote stage comes after the blastocyst stage that I just referred to. Um, it's about um, the first 10 to 14 days. Um, from conception until implantation in the uterus. So that's a, a, a long delay between when conception occurs and then the zygote actually implants into the uterus and becomes an embryo at that point. Um, once the implantation has occurred, it's called an embryo. Here we have an um, eight-week embryo, so that would be um, right at the end of the embryonic stage. And at this point, we can see some... Um, milestones have occurred already on our little embryo. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about embryos is that if you were to take this embryo, line it up next to a, a, a tadpole or a chicken or a golden retriever or something like that, you'd have a hard time not being an embryologist knowing the difference among those different vertebrates. They all have very similar structures during the embryonic stage. Um, and it may not be that it's eight weeks after conception for the tadpole. They may be, it may be fewer weeks for them because they have, they have a shorter, you know, gestation period in that egg anyway. Um, but if you get them at the same stage and line them up, it is really weird how similar they look. There used to be a TV show on National Geographic Channel called um, In the Womb. And I always loved to join a little bit late so I would not know what creature we were following. And sometimes it would turn out to be an elephant. You know, sometimes it was a, a golden retriever. Sometimes it was a chimpanzee. You know, you didn't know what you were watching. Um, and I always loved that part about it. I'd come in a little late, so I, it's not been ruined for me. And I'd try and guess, what is it? And I was horrible at it. I, I'd be thinking, this one's got to be the dog, and it turns out to be a bear. And it's just, it was very challenging because embryos look very similar to each other. Um, what you'll notice is, first off, you see this spinal cord right, where you can see the, not cord, the spinal column is what I meant to say, because you can see the vertebra, these little hatched marks here. Those are housing the spinal cord. Um, our central nervous system has started to develop, but what it mainly is is spinal cord and then brain stem. So you see the thalamus up here at the top, right? It's basically a brain stem at this point. Um, you're starting to see some external structures developing at the same time. So you see this little flipper that is going to become an arm, and there's a little see-through flipper down here also that's going to become a leg. Um, but you'll notice the leg is here, and see how the, the embryo still has a tail? Um, ultimately, the rump of this little um, embryo, as it becomes a fetus, will catch up and cover up that, that tail. You can see some internal organs. You can see the heart and, and the liver um, developing. You can see over here on the, on the top what is going to become an eye 
it has to move from this position, which is practically on the back of the head, all the way around to the front of the head for full development. Up here at the top of the thalamus is the beginning of, uh, of the nose. It's kind of in a blowhole position initially, and then it has to rotate all the way down to the front of the face. So there's a lot of, of migration that occurs during gestation. At this stage, this little eight-week embryo is about the size of a kidney bean. I don't know why we always compare it to food, but um, so we got a kidney bean. It's about 0.63 inches long and weighs, you know, not even a tenth of an ounce, uh, four one-hundredths of an ounce. Here we are one week later. This is a slightly different picture because they've included more structures in the image. So let's start with those structures. Um, we've got down here at the bottom, that's the placenta. And it's it's going to grow a lot during the pregnancy. And so this, um, this placenta is roughly the right size to support this little nine-week um, fetus. It will continue to grow to provide adequate nutrition and oxygen and, and so on to the um, developing fetus as it gets bigger. And you can see the little umbilical cord going from the placenta up to the uh, fetus's abdomen. And then you see this balloon that's surrounding the fetus, and that's called the amniotic sac, and it's full of fluid. Every single thing that you're seeing in this picture is all made out of baby's DNA. So this is, a lot of times people mistakenly believe that the baby is in contact with its mom during gestation. And it really isn't because everything's filtered through that umbilical cord. There's this barrier of the amniotic sac. Um, it's, so the baby is very protected in this um, sac and pr doesn't really come in contact with mom. There's no exchange of blood or anything like that at the placenta level either. The mom's blood comes up to the placenta and delivers oxygen and nutrition, and sometimes, unfortunately, toxins or um, infections. And then the, but the placenta does a really good job of filtering out a lot of those things. And then the baby's blood brings up to the placenta waste products that mom's blood will pick up and just, you know, get rid of. So everything you're looking at here is all baby DNA. Um, now let's look at the baby a little closer because if you look compared to just one week earlier, first off, let's start with that eye that I had pointed out. Now you see that the eye has moved to roughly the side of the head. It also has grown a lens. So now you're seeing that black area there that is the eye and it's grown a lens. Um, it's not done. We've got more work to do on that eye, but at least you can see it a little better now. You can also see this little protuberance over here that is the ear and it's way down on the neck right now. Um, it's really hard to see them over here on this um, eight-week embryo, there's little, um, it's kind of like a gill when it's eight weeks. And w by nine weeks, we see it's actually turning into an ear. Um, the nose has made its way down from the top of the head to down. It's now exactly even with the eyes. So it needs to lower some more in order for the face to continue to develop. Now, if you look down at the body, you can see little ribs are encasing those organs that it just one week later didn't have ribs. And those little paddles that had been arms are now fully formed arms and little fingers and fully formed legs and little toes. The rump has caught up to the little tail. So in just one week, an enormous amount of growth has occurred. Meanwhile, though, it's only about the size of a grape and is not even quite an inch long and has only gained 0.03 of an ounce in weight. 16 weeks takes us to, uh, you know, well into the fetal stage. And again, you can see that placenta and see how it stays basically proportional to the, to the size of the developing fetus. So that placenta continues to grow so that at the end of pregnancy, that placenta weighs about four and a half pounds on average. Um, in this picture, it looks like the, the amniotic sac is not as full of water because the baby's starting to fill it up. And so you've got the amniotic sac around it. So here we are just seven weeks after the previous picture, and now you can see eyebrows and eyelids, and there's actually even little eyelashes on there. And you can see the fingers and the fingernails and the little fingerprints, and you can see the feet and, and little footprints, and like all the parts are there, even though we are only looking at something about the size of an avocado that's, that's about four and a half inches long, and it only weighs about three and a half ounces. So it's a very small but fully formed as far as external structures. You'll notice the nose is in its proper place and things like that. The big job for the remainder of pregnancy with regard to the body is getting bigger. Um, the average baby at birth is about 20 inches long and weighs about seven pounds. Um, so a lot of growth needs to occur between you know the 16 week little avocado and the fully term, I don't know, watermelon. I don't know what's 
size you would call a full, full-term newborn. Um, but a lot of growth has to happen before this happens. Birth. I don't think this is a brand newborn that just came out, but I found this picture on the Internet of a baby who's crying like it's a pretty new baby, maybe getting its first bath. They do not really care for it. the uh, air on their skin and the cold, and it's just horrible. Life is hard <laughs> when you're a newborn. Um, but so birth occurs, and if you're really super interested in how that happens, you know, a nice life and <laughs> development class should be in your um, future. If you're really interested in the changes that happen to mom during pregnancy and stuff like that, human sexuality is a great class. Not um, gender and sexuality, human sexuality, because that includes, you know, physical stuff like pregnancy. I'm glossing over a lot of things because this is introductory psychology. Okay, so we have this newborn. A lot of times people think that newborns come into the world pretty unequipped. You know, they really don't know anything, can't really do anything. But it turns out that nature provides newborns with a lot of skills that will help them to survive mostly. And then we have some other skills that might be just throwbacks to, um, you know, ancient times. So let's check them out. First off, these inborn skills are called reflexes. And I've copied and pasted for you the legitimate exactly definition of reflex because a lot of times people think reflexes are learned. They're not. They are responses that are inborn and do not have to be learned. That is the, the thing that makes them reflexes is that you can't help but do them. You don't learn to do them. Your body just does it. So what are we talking about with newborns? Let's focus in on a few that are evidence that babies need to be fed. The rooting reflex. Found a nice GIF that shows us the rooting reflex. If you tickle an infant on their cheek, they'll turn their head, and whatever it is that was tickling their cheek, the baby will um, initiate sucking. So the rooting reflex is referring to the fact that the, the infant turns their head and searches with their mouth for whatever was tickling them on their cheek. So you can imagine that, you know, in the dark when a baby's being fed, you know, mom's breast or the bottle might not land exactly in the baby's mouth because we're all in the dark and we're all trying. Um, and so it's really helpful that the baby can turn their head toward and open their mouth for and grasp onto with their mouth whatever it is that's tickling them on their cheek. It could be a finger in the case of somebody who's doing it as a demo, though. <laughs> um, the sucking reflex. If something is in a baby's mouth, they rhythmically suck on it, demonstrating this inborn tendency to suck in a very specific way. They latch on with their tongue and they move their jaws forward and back in an effort to, um, you know, really that's the best way to cause milk to come out of a breast is to do this kind of sucking method. And so it works the best on a bottle too. If you've ever tried to drink out of a baby bottle, um, when I was in high school, we'd have like spirit days and one of the challenges would be drinking out of a bottle or something. Well, I wish I'd known back then that the way to get, you know, fluid to come out of a baby bottle is to actually latch on with your tongue and then move your jaw back and forth because that actually causes it to squirt right down your throat. If you suck the way we suck, it's really hard to get things out of baby bottles. Uh, babies are uniquely designed to get, with their sucking strategy, to get fluid to come out of a, a nipple or a, a bottle. And probably the most effective of all of their um, reflexes is they cry really adamantly when they're hungry. They cry in a way, if you've ever had the pleasure of hearing a newborn cry, <laughs> that was sarcasm, by the way, because it is not fun to hear a newborn crying in hunger, um, you will do just about anything to try and make it stop. I mean, you are running around trying to find something that will satisfy this crying baby. Um, it's very effective. At getting, you know, at the goal, which is to get this baby fed. Um, so these are considered ref reflexes because the baby's not doing it on purpose. These newborns don't know that mom or dad is tired and that, you know, my crying is interrupting your sleeping. They don't know anything about that. They have no concept of I'm lonely. They have no concept of any of that stuff. All they know is when my stomach is empty, I have to, I have to scream. I have to cry. Um, if as it starts to get empty, they'll start to do little precursor noises and smart parents will recognize the precursor noise and start to um, prepare something to eat knowing that we're about to go to the big cry. Um, now these reflexes will last four to six weeks after birth and they start to wane as babies start to replace reflexes with learned strategies. 
So um, as babies have interactions with their parents, they start to figure out the most effective ways to get what they need from their parents. But these are, that I'm describing here, these are the reflexive strategies. Um, and they can't help but do these things. It's not like they can prevent themselves from crying when they're hungry. There are some other reflexes that babies display that are quite peculiar and make you think, what is this? Uh, why is my baby doing this? This is so weird. Um, we think that some of these are evolutionary throwbacks, that they're evidence that maybe in this case, um, maybe babies and mommies used to sleep in trees. And so if a baby starts to fall, it reflexively throws its arms out, throws its legs out, sucks its mouth in really hard. So if you imagine um, a mom and a baby, you know, early hominin sleeping in a tree, baby is snuggled up against mom, probably has mom's nipple in her mouth, even if baby's not currently eating. And if baby starts to slip, now I've made lots of air, lots of uh, room where mom could grab me and I've sucked in really hard on my mouth so that I've at least got mom by the nipple. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <sighs> and maybe there's a better chance that I'm not going to actually fall if I do these things. Now, i got to say, I've had two kids, and when they do this startle reflex in modern times and you're trying to carry them back to their crib or whatever and they do this, you almost drop them. So in modern times, it's not only not beneficial, it might be harmful that they still do these, you know, really ancient, um, you know, reflexive startle things that might have at some point in our ancestral past been beneficial, but they are absolutely not beneficial anymore. Stepping reflex. Here we have a naked baby that somebody kindly put a dot over for us so we don't <laughs> that's their nakedness. I did not put the dot on there. Here we have, look at that baby. That baby is probably two to four weeks old, I'm going to guess. They've got the baby on hard surface. They're stretching that Achilles tendon on the back of the heel, and it's triggering this automatic alternate, alternating stepping behavior. If you have the opportunity to ever handle a newborn, put them on something firm like this, like the floor or a table or something support their weight. I mean, look at this poor baby. He can't even really hold up his head and we're, you know, making him do this. You got to support the baby. Stretch out that Achilles tendon, which can be hard. They want to bend their knees. They want to go up on their toes. You got to kind of hold, get somebody else with a third hand to like hold their foot down so it stretches that Achilles tendon and all of a sudden they'll start doing the stepping reflex. I had my new newborn baby, I guess he was probably three weeks old and we were at McDonald's one time and I was holding him up at the table and he was doing this. And the people next to us are like, your baby can walk? And I'm like, no, he can't walk. <laughs> Look at his head, it's all bobbing around and he's all, you know, can't hold anything together. But he was alternating his feet so convincingly that they thought, well, maybe he can walk. That's crazy. Pretty fun. You can put your kids through the paces if you have them or your niece or nephew or something. Um, grasp reflex. Be newborn babies, as this one shows you, can hold their own weight with their, the strength of their grasp. So you can get them to hold on, and look at that, you can pull that little baby up by their, just by their own grasp. And you know, this is kind of fun, because you, you know, with a new baby, you let them hold your finger, and you're like, wow, so strong, ninja power, whatever. Um, all babies have it. They hold on so tight that their little knuckles turn white um, because of this grasping reflex. Now, all of these reflexes, all the ones I've described, plus the other ones I didn't describe, they tend to, to start going away around six weeks of age, you know, most of them start to disappear. In fact, if you're a year old and you're still displaying some of these um, reflexes, it can be a sign of neurological problems. So these are clearly, you know, very acute responses that are necessary in the early periods or just apparently entertaining in the early period. And then they go away as the baby ages. Okay, now I'm going to make some claims throughout this chapter about what babies know or what babies like. And hopefully you are properly skeptical about my claims because how in the world do we know what a baby likes or what a baby knows? They can't talk. They can't take surveys. They barely, you know, will look at things for us. It's very difficult. So developmental psychologists got really clever and they came up with a technique called habituation. They discovered that babies will stare at things that are engaging to them. And engaging things are oftentimes things that are new um, or things that are complex or at the right level of complexity for a baby where it's like 
it's got enough detail that I'm not bored by it, but not so much detail that I can't figure it out. They will stare longer at those things. They stare longer at things that they know. Like they will stare longer at their own mom than they will at other um, women or other people. So habituation studies allow us to figure out what babies already know, what babies find interesting. So you see these two items. We would put these in front of a newborn baby and we'd have eye tra tracking software on our computer so we can look at what the baby's looking at on the screen and see which does the baby look at more. The one on the left that looks like kind of like a human face organization or do they look at the one on the right, the one that doesn't look like a human face? Well, it turns out that newborns, during the newborn period, up until about three months really, they'll stare longer at the one that looks like the human face. And the theory is that that's because, um, you know, these, this is familiar. They're really trying to understand human faces, so they stare at them a lot. What's interesting is as they get older and they start to go, oh, yeah, that's a human face. Ooh, what is this weird organization on the right? So babies who are six months and older tend to look at the, the surprising one, the non-human face organized one. So I'm going to be talking about newborns, and so I'm going to talk about um, the fact that they tend to stare longer at things that they recognize. Um, older babies, when we start talking about habituation studies with them, we're going to be looking at, they'll stare longer at things that surprise them. Okay. There's my little image of a human face, just in case you didn't recognize that the one on the left looks more like a human face. Babies are trying to understand things. So um, one of the most motivating things for them to understand is other people. They, babies are born with certain social capabilities. Right off, from the very beginning, babies prefer humans over any other kind of visual stimulus, um, any other kind of auditory stimulus. So, for example, babies will calm down, suck on their binky more reliably while listening to human voices compared to any other stimulus. Um, you might have heard that ticking clocks are soothing to babies. Well, they're more soothing than other things, but human voices are more soothing than ticking clocks. Uh, more soothing than a cat purring, which is a pretty soothing sound. Uh, more soothing than a heartbeat to a newborn. Now, all of the things that I just listed are more soothing than most noises, right? Heartbeats, ticking clocks, purring kittens. Those things are more soothing than um, most music with one little catch. Babies find familiar music soothing. So if moms have played the same song every night during their pregnancy, a newborn will soothe to that song more than other sounds. So there are some exceptions to what I'm saying. But on average, voices, and, and really what they like is droning kind of muffled voices, because that's what they've experienced in the womb, is the sound of a droning kind of muffled voice. If there's a lot of distinction and stuff in the voice, it might not be soothing to them. Faces are also something that babies are really attracted to. They really prefer human faces over any other um, shape. Back in the 80s, they used to say that, um, that babies prefer um, geometric shapes. They'll stare at those longer and they find those really interesting. Well, that might be true for older babies, but for younger babies, human faces are the best thing that you could put on, let's say, a mobile. It doesn't even have to be human particularly. It just has to be an anthropomorphized animal something that they can really readily see, that those are eyes and a mouth and, and like that. Um, newborn babies don't have the greatest vision. They have, um, they're, they're very nearsighted. So things have to be within about six to 10 inches of their face for them to be able to see it very clearly. And so a lot of times we wonder why we bother buying mobiles for newborns when they can't really see it. Well, if you're gonna get a, new, a, a mobile for a newborn, you wanna have it be really high contrast so that they can make it out and then uh, human faces are the best things or animal faces or something that, you know, very anthropomorphized. Now, within the humans, babies prefer their parents. And let's be honest, they prefer mom. It's um, very clear that in almost immediately after birth, babies imprint on their moms. Uh, so right away, they recognize their mom's smell. Now, this video obviously isn't even available through this URL anymore. Sometimes people bootleg things and put it on YouTube and then it gets pulled down. This video was an, an, uh, a report on a study that was conducted where they had moms who had just given birth 
and they were allowed to hold their babies and interact with their babies one hour or five hours before participating in the study. So don't worry. They didn't let the mom interact with the baby for an hour and then make them be away from their baby for four hours so they could be in the study. They just, you got to see them for an hour, now we're going to start the study. Or you got to be with them for five hours, and now we're going to start the study. So they found that moms who had only spent an hour with their babies did not recognize their babies by sight. They couldn't, literally could not pick their baby out of a lineup. They were shown Polaroids of six babies, one of which was their own, and the moms were at the chance level of being able to pick their own baby out of a lineup. But when they were provided with plastic bags that contained the little clothing that the newborns had been wearing, and they were given six bags to open up and smell, the moms who had only spent an hour were able to accurately um, pull their own baby's clothing from that lineup. So mom seems to recognize baby smell, and baby seems to recognize mom smell within about three hours of exposure. So within about three hours, babies will reliably turn their heads towards a pile of their mom's clothing that's on one side versus their dad's or some strange woman's clothing that's on the other side. So babies within three hours also now can recognize their moms. So we've got this beautiful smell-based identification going on between mom recognizing her baby by smell and baby recognizing mom by smell. Um, mom's voice. This one I found on, on YouTube, and, and this baby um, is crying. Looks like a very newborn baby, right? This baby's actively crying. And then mom just says a few words, and the baby just stops crying. Right, baby recognizes, oh, that's my mom, I can calm down. Um, we think that babies develop the ability to recognize their mom's voice from this last few weeks of, of pregnancy. Um, babies' ears develop during the you know first nine weeks of after conception, but they aren't wired up to the brain and conveying information to the brain until about the 30th week after conception. So that leaves us eight to 10 weeks when babies are collecting information from their ears, taking it to their brain and learning what their mom's voice sounds like. I mean, that's the one that they hear the most is their mom's voice. So that at birth, their mom's voice is comforting, familiar, and they recognize it. They'll turn their heads towards their moms, things like that. Now dads can improve the likelihood babies will recognize their voice by talking legitimately to the stomach, like get as close as you can, maybe um, use a little megaphone type of approach and talk through it to the stomach so that the baby can learn to recognize dad or other partner's voice. Um, so but at, at birth, then everybody can be equally soothing to the baby because the baby prefers the familiar. Baby will soothe more to the familiar. Okay. I think that's all I was going to say about newborn period. Seems like a good place to break because now I'm going to transition into covering the topics of lifespan development and talking about how we change over the lifespan within that topic. So our first topic in our next segment will be motor development. 